Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Somehow the second always, always. <laughs> well, I want to acknowledge our friends from Avon Park, Dr. Tamayo and Dr. Laxon for that beautiful, beautiful rendition of the New Jerusalem. I wish I could sing like them. Don't you think? Would you like to sing like them? Yes. Well, we have a chance. When we go to heaven, we are told that we are going to join the angelic uh, choir. And so let us strive to be there. Eh? What do you say? Amen. Amen. Well, Sister Vivian Rossetti is our uh, senior coordinator for the church. And he asked me to preach today on the topic of grandparents. I think he chose me because I'm probably one of the older grandparents in this church. <laughs> well, it takes a grandparent to talk about grandparents, isn't it? Well, it's just like asking a plumber to talk about plumbing or a doctor talking about medical practice. So uh, I suppose I qualify for that. I'm a grandfather, children of three, and grandchildren of three. And actually, uh, we came here to Florida and chose this as our retirement uh, home simply because of our grandchildren, believe it or not. There were three of them, and now there's only one left. Do you know that I didn't know that there's such a thing as Grandparents' Day? Do you know? Anybody knows that there is such a thing as Grandparents' Day? Yes, you know? We know. I don't know. <laughs> I only found out when I was preparing the sermon. I know there is Mother's Day, uh, there is uh, Father's Day, but Grandparents' Day? There's not even a Parents' Day, is there? No, there's not. <laughs> well, Grandparents' Day uh, was celebrated actually, as uh, Brother Maya said uh, last week. It is the official Grandparents' Day. Uh, and that is usually after uh, Labor Day. <coughs> uh, um, it was actually an initiative of a uh, home maker in a small town in Virginia called Fayette. His name is Marianne McQuaid. And through his efforts, he was able to convince the governor of West Virginia to declare a a day to celebrate grandparents. And so in 1973, the governor of Virginia signed a proclamation. For the first time, Grandfather's Day was observed. And he did not see, did not, fin he did not just stop there. He was able to convince Congress five years later uh, to set up a national uh, holiday observance for grandparents. And so five years later, the then Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, signed a proclamation making national grandparents as a national observance day. When we talk about grandparents, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Anybody? What comes to your mind when we talk about grandparents? Huh? They are old. <laughs> they are old. Well, I don't know. Uh, it's about their age. People consider them as old people, but just how old is old? How do you define, oh, he's old? Yeah. Huh? Gray hair. OK, so I qualify. Oh, what if I, I dye my hair? <laughs> well, it's, high, it's, it's, it's relative to me because if you are, say, 70 years old, as old as I am, I'm more than 70, and you're among people who are 80 years old, then you are young, right? And if you are 40 years old among teenagers, then you're old. So it's how you look at it, isn't it? Grandparents. I made a point to make sure that the grandparents is not one word, but 
two words, grand. And so every time you, I don't know a word, I look up at the dictionary. And here is the definition of what grand means. It is higher in rank or importance. It is magnificent. Another one is, it's complete. Well, I could see the magnificence and ranking importance, but complete, how does that come into the picture? Well, I thought about it. This is just my own definition or in understanding of uh, the complete uh, definition of uh, grandparents. Well, I think they are done. <laughs> Not, <laughs> they are done. In other words, they are done doing the normal job of a parent. <laughs> okay, they have graduated. They are no longer in charge of taking care of the kids, uh, sending them to school, or nurturing them, but they are done. In other words, mission accomplished. <laughs> Thank God, hallelujah. <laughs> in America, the official age of so-called senior citizens is, I think, 65, and that is, uh, uh, when you come to six, age of 65, you are not qualified to withdraw your Social Security. <laughs> so if you were born in the 1950s, you are a senior citizen. You know, NBC aired a program uh, a few years ago <clears throat> and uh, found the most defining change taking place in America. Let me just put this one on. Good. And here are some of the statistics. Can you, uh, okay. Someone turns 50, 50 years old every six minutes. People over 50 account for 43% of all of us, that's almost 50%, are 50 and over. And the over 85 age group is the fastest growing segment of the population. In other words, uh, people are living longer, uh, probably simply because uh, of uh, the information, the knowledge that we know about nutrition and uh, some of the, uh, the good uh, food that we need to eat, <clears throat> as well as changes in our lifestyle. Most of the people in the Bible, the famous ones from Adam and Eve and on, are grandparents. Before the flood, people are living in the hundreds of years. That was before the flood. And I tried to find out why they're living that long and we are living this short. Adam was the son when he was 30 years old. Well, that would be probably equivalent to about 20 or 30 years old today. At 100 years old, you, you're probably all done. How many of you here are 90 or above? Anybody who is 90 years old? I don't see any hand. See, even 100 years old, it's very rare to see, uh, to meet somebody who is uh, nine. 100 years old. Who is the oldest man that ever lived? Trivia question. Hello? Methuselah? Are you sure? Methuselah was the oldest man that ever died. He was 969 years old. His father was who? Hello? Who was Methuselah's father? Enoch. Enoch is the oldest man that ever lived. Why? Because he did not die. <laughs> so by calculation, he would be probably 8,000 years old today. Just imagine that. Well, we'll be longer, we'll be living longer than 8,000, believe me or not, when we go to heaven. In Genesis 5, 22. 
Okay, that's it. In Genesis 5, 22 and 24, and Enoch walked with God. After he begot Methuselah, 300 years, and all the days of Enoch was 365 years. Verse 24, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. You know, when the words are repeated, it is very important. And here, it is repeated twice, in verse 22 and verse 25, uh, 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch walked with God. How do you like that? To be as your epitaph. And so and so walk with God in your tombstone. And Romela walk with God. And Ron walk with God. And so and so walk with God. That would be a nice thing to, to have in your tombstone. Unfortunately, Enoch didn't have to use an epitaph because he went to heaven. Most biographies of famous men and women are written in voluminous books. Since my retirement, I have all the time in the world to read books. And uh, I like to read books of uh, famous people, like uh, MacArthur. I was, you know, I had read three books on MacArthur, Eisenhower, Patton, and uh, uh, all those uh, prime ministers like uh, uh, Churchill. I also read the books of, old, of uh, bad people like Hitler and Mussolini. And it's interesting, but all these uh, written in big voluminous books. But Enoch's biography is summed up in five words. And Enoch walk with God. How do you like that? <clears throat> when we were in Eustace, uh, I look at uh, some of the tombstones in there, and most of them are said, in memory of, in memory of, in memory of. <clears throat> My dear grandparents, cool grandparents, are we earnestly and faithfully walking with God? That's what we want to do, don't we? But just how do we walk with God? How do we walk with God? Well, think about some, somebody you're working with. When you're working with somebody, you have to know that person, isn't it? To be walking with him or her. Well, there are times when you walk, and I know I, my wife and I walk uh, around the lake there in uh, Ponkan uh, near our house. And uh, there are some who walk along with us as well. But uh, the, in the interchange is just high. But when you're walking with somebody, you got to know that person, isn't it? And then you two are going in the same direction. One cannot be going the other way, and otherwise you will not be walking uh, with him. Your steps will be at pace with the same person that you are. Otherwise, you'll be left behind. And your walk with that, your attention will be mutual. You just don't talk about yourself. And I know there are some people who like to talk about themselves. All you have to do is to go in a restaurant and then uh, eavesdrop some of those uh, people who are talking. There's always one dominant <laughs> person who is always talking. Yeah. You need to share. Uh, your mutual interest if you want to walk together. And then we look at examples of uh, famous uh, uh, people, examples of people who walk with God. And of course, Enoch was uh, a very good example in the Bible who walked with God. He was probably the most uh, common example for us to illustrate this concept. Again, in Genesis 5.22, and he said, the gist of this passage and Enoch worked with God is that Enoch had a close contact with God. God is his priority. He thinks about God in the morning. He thinks about God in the evening. And that is what Enoch was. There's another man who was described in the same and blank, blank, walk with God. Who is that? Any guess? 
you know, I mean Noah. Let's look at uh, Genesis 6, 9. Noah was the just man and perfect in his generation. And in and Noah walked with God. So he's another person who, before the flood, together with Enoch, walked with God. But the fact that they, that they are that they walk with God doesn't necessarily mean that they have not sinned. Because we are told that uh, even Noah uh, was drunk at one time. <laughs> and exposed himself uh, and nakedly. And his sons were so embarrassed that they had to cover him uh, with looking backwards. But uh, they are not perfect in any way. But they walked with God. Another way how we can walk with God is to focus on God. Let go of distractions. Before you focus on God, you have to make sure uh, you need to let go of the distractions, the worldly things that force you to separate from God and your relationship with God. These distractions may not necessarily be sins in itself, per se, but they are include anything that will alienate you from God intentionally and subconsciously uh, Prioritize yourself over God. Think again of uh, what it's like to walk with a friend. If your friend spends the entire time talking on the cell phone, <clears throat> rather than interacting with you, then that walk will not be very meaningful, is it? You know? Similarly, the distractions you focus on instead of focusing on God, can prevent you from really walking together with God. Even things that are beneficial, for example, working hard to earn money to support your family, is a good thing. But if you're obsessed with money and working hard to support your family <clears throat> and neglecting your family, and neglecting your relationship with God, then you have allowed yourself to have these as distractions in your life. Read the Bible. It is the word of God. It may not give you the specific instructions, but you can learn from the examples of people who have made the right decisions, and also people who have made the wrong decisions, and you learn lessons from there. Try to meditate. Meditation is very good. The best time to really meditate, as far as me personally, is early morning when everything is quiet. I go outside and hear nothing but birds and very quiet. So it's thinking about God. My wife and I likes to walk around that lake, in that Apopka Lake, not, that, not the big one, right on Poncan. And it's nice just to walk quietly and look at nature, and look at the beauty of nature that God has made. Another thing, uh, how to walk with God, is to follow God's leadings. <clears throat> Take time to sit down and reflect upon your walk with God thus far. Think about those times when you walk with God, as well as those times when you were doing things that pull you away from God. Not making time to pray, for example, and devotion or attending church, for that matter. Obey God's commands. God says that to love God as well as to love your fellow men. Seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Fellowship. You know that we have friends outside of our faith, but it is important for us to fellowship with the fellowship of our own church, those who share the same passion and dedication to God. Nowadays, there is a need for parents to work 
in order to cope up with the financial needs of uh, the family. So who do you think spent more quality time with the children? The grandchildren, grandparents. My wife and I babysit our one granddaughter once in a while, twice a week actually, we try to uh, pick them up in, in First Baptist Church, 45 minutes one way. Well, it's not a chore for us, we enjoy it. Why? Because that's what grandparents are for, All right? Pastor goes to, has uh, also his apostolic mission. I think for a year, he has two grandkids who was with him. And I think his apostolic mission was just finished uh, last week when he brought his grandkids to, to Canada. And I'm sure that uh, he missed them and the kids as well missed them as well. Our children and grandchildren need, need the word of God. And we as parents and grandparents <coughs> need to live out our lives before them. They need the word of God applied daily in their lives. In Psalm 78, verse 4, it says, We will not hide them from their children, telling the new generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. We need to remember that good things that God has done in our lives. Our children need to know God's faithfulness to their parents and to their grandparents. They need also to know the will of God. And every child should know their Bible as a foundation of good decisions in their lives. Don't forget what God has done for you in the past. From the pen of inspiration, I'll read. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we forget what the Lord has done for us in the past. Why? Well, because what good things God has done for us in the past, he can do it again for us in the present. We have a challenge in our church. It's an enormous challenge. Sometimes we think it's impossible to do it, but I think through God's help and looking back at what God has done for us in the past, we'll have that courage and we have that faith that we can do it. I cannot help but relate our experience on Hinsdale, when Hinsdale uh, was the first Filipino uh, church that was established in the Midwest. It started as a group of uh, believers, maybe about 20. and. Uh, I noticed that a lot of them were scattered in this big church, 1,500 uh, member church. And they were not participating in the discussion on the Sabbath school. So we decided uh, to get together. And so the first Sabbath school class was made of all Filipinos. And it was good because now people, be, uh, people begin to interact begins to, to talk and in their own language. And from then, we have the Hinsdale Philam Church. Philam, I mean, uh, Hinsdale is a high-end community. Most of the executives from Chicago live in Hinsdale. And so it's quite a bit of expensive property there. And uh, we did, uh, had a fundraising, just like what we are doing right now. We had a fundraising uh, and uh, with the thought of buying a property that was being sold for $140,000. Well, to make the long story short, we were able to generate only $70,000. So we talked to the owner and he said, we cannot afford it. Uh, we have only $70,000 that we have generated as our fundraising. Two weeks later, I got a call. Well, I was the, I was the chairman of the fundraising, so I know the details. <laughs> and so I got a call. He said, Mr. Rhoda, uh, let us talk. He said, who is this? 
oh, this is the owner of that property that you're interested in, in Isdale. And they say, well, no, I know we cannot afford your, you know, your, the, the 140,000, we don't have that kind of money. Well, let's talk anyway. So uh, together with one elder, we, we went together and talked to her. To make the long story short, he gave us that property for $70,000. Miracle? Coinfid con uh, coincidental? Or? No, it's not. Pre it's providential. God works in mysterious way. There is no thing impossible with God. And so as we look for the challenges today in our church, let us look back and see what God has done for us in the past. There's a poem of a, um, a famous American poet. His name is Robert Frost. I'm sure all of you have heard about him. And he has a poem called The Road Less Troubled. This is how he put it. I shall be telling of this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in the woods. And I took the one less traveled by, and that made all the difference. Enoch chose to walk the road less traveled, when most of the people around him were wicked. How about us today, my dear friends? Are we walking the road less troubled that leads to eternal life? Or are we traveling the easy and wide road that leads to destruction? Let's go back to our subject of grandparents. Amen. Our Seventh-day Adventist grandparents, parents, and young people, we need to love to respect everyone, and especially our elderly in their sunset years of their lives. In Genesis 20, or ex Exodus 20, verse 12, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord by God giving you. That is the first commandment with promise, isn't it? Where does it say that your days may be long? Because oftentimes rebellious and stubborn and know it all young people, and I'm not talking about you guys over there. <laughs> and sometimes this no all it know young people don't want to listen to the wisdom of uh, their elders, you know, their parents, and oftentimes they lead a hard and messy life and end up their lives in a short time due to their own mistakes. Notice father and mother, but <clears throat> sadly enough, many times in many homes, this is not the case. Divorce rates in America are very high. There's a lot of single parent in this country. Recent statistics have shown that 6.5 6 of marriage for every 1,000 population, but the divorce rate is 3.3 per 1,000 population. So what does that mean? So for every two marriages, there is one who can't make it. Some don't even get married. They just, what you call, cohabitate. Let's get together. Why bother about getting married? And this rate is increasing high as well. And also the study has found that a single parent, and usually the father is not there, have proven itself to be creating criminals. Why? Because there is no discipline in the home. Remember when we were young, when we become mischievous or do something wrong, 
my mother will say, wait till your dad comes home. Because he always, the, the father is always the, the disciplinarian, and he's the last word. And especially when he talks to us in Spanish, we know we're in trouble. <laughs> we live in a culture that promotes youthfulness and denies the importance of the elderly. The Bible tells us instead in Leviticus 19.32, you shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of the old men slash woman and fear your God. I am the Lord. We have a very great family, Filipino family tradition, and that is what we call mano. You know, I don't know whether your children are taught that to, to mano, the elderly. How many of you have children here and who teach them how to mano? Do you know what is mano? In Spanish, it's called hen. So every time your children will meet or will greet your elderly, you mano, you kiss their, their hand like this. I'm sure that in your own ethnic uh, cultures, you have one, some ways of demonstrating that as well. But we have this mano. You mano to anybody who is older than you, whether he is educated, whether he is poor or rich, you mano. Yeah. That's what we have been taught. And I hope that we'll continue that tradition of mano. In other words, this can be an antidote to some of these uh, rebellious uh, young people. The young need the old and the old need the young. The problem sometimes is that our young people don't lack respect for our elderly. There are some cases, however, that where people are not good examples. In Ecclesiastes 4.13, it tells us, better a poor, but wise youth than an old but foolish king who will no longer knows how to take advice. So we have a symbiotic relationship, both old and, uh, and young. Today, grandparents stand in the, between the past and generation and the generations to come. And we have been entrusted with those who have gone before us the great and important truths of the Bible truths to be preserved and to be handed down to future generations. There were four scholars who were arguing about uh, the Bible translations. One said, I prefer the King James Version because uh, of its eloquence of old English language. Another said, I like the American Standard Version because of its literal interpretation. The other said, oh, I prefer the Moffat translation. Then the fourth scholar admitted that he personally preferred his mother's translation. <laughs> when the other scholars laughed, he responded, yes, she translated it. She translated every page of the Bible into life. It is the most convincing translation I have ever read. Yes, my dear friends, we need not just to read the Bible and study the Bible, but it should be committed in the way we live. I would like to share with you a sad story, but ended up actually in a beautiful way. Papi, that's what her granddaughter calls him was a pleasant fellow. Papi owned a pawn shop. Everyone who knew him ex respected and adored him. There was a room in the back of his shop where he spent time tinkering with his own precious items like pocket watches and radios and clocks and electric trains. One day, Papi was reassembling a toy train when he heard the doorbell. It's not the push button that we have nowadays, 
but no, it's one of those bells that hang on top of the door that when you open it, it rings. The bell had been in Papi's family for 100 years, and he cherished it dearly. So Papi went down and, and see who his customer was. It was a little girl. She said, I want to buy a present for my grandpa, but I don't know what to get. Papa, Papi made some suggestions. Well, how about a pocket watch? Well, the girl didn't answer. Or maybe your grandpa would like a radio. Finally, the girl walked around the door and wiggled the door to ring the bell. The girl smiled with excitement. This is it. Mommy says grandpa loves music. Just then, Papi knew that she wanted the doorbell. Papi tried to let her understand that it had been with the family for many years, and that was why he was not selling it. The girl said, I guess. I understand. Thank you anyway. Suddenly, Papi thought of how the rest of the family was gone, except for his estranged daughter whom he had not seen for years. Papi thought, why not pass the bell on to someone who, uh, who shared it with a loved one? I decided to sell the bell. The little girl said, oh, thank you. Grandpa will be so happy. Papi felt good about helping that little girl, even though he knew he would miss the bell. Later that evening, Papi prepared to close shop and found himself thinking about the bell and how any grandfather would cherish anything from such a precious child. Just as he tried to turn the lights off, Papi thought he heard the bell. But he knew he couldn't because he had already sold it. In a minute, he heard the bell again. He turned towards the door, and more, there stood that little girl. She was ringing the bell and smiling. Papi was puzzled. What's this? Have you changed your mind? No, she said. Mommy says it's for you. Before Papi had any time to say another word, the child's mother stepped into the door and was choking back. The child's mother stepped into the door and was choking back her tears. She said, hello, Dad. I feel goosebumps when I finish this reading. So for us, grandparents and parents, the bell is ringing for us as well. The greatest thing that we can give our children is our lives. We need to be parents and grandparents so that our children and grandchildren will love to come home too. No matter what our children and grandchildren have done, each of us will leave a legacy, and the life we choose to live will have an impact on those who will come after us. That is far greater than what we can give. We need to show our children and our grandchildren how to lead a godly life. And when we do that, the rest follows. We need to show them how to, live, to love. We need to show them how to forgive. We need to show them how to honor and respect everyone. But most of all, also to respect our elders, 
and to show them how to prepare their lives so that they can live forever with their parents and grandparents in that earth made new, where we will not be longer in separated by families, but we'll be in one big family, the family of God. At this time, we would like to honor our grandparents. So can we ask uh, Teresa to please distribute some of these flowers to honor our grandparents? And may we ask all grandparents to please stand where you are so that we can honor you as well. Every grandparent, please stand. There's quite a few. And please keep standing. To honor such a noble role of being a grandparent, we'd like to respectfully ask all grandparents then, please stand. We're hoping that we have enough. So in behalf of um, the seniors ministry, we present you these flowers as a token of our appreciation and love. Um, we have the youth, the, the uh, youth deacons to distribute them so the kids don't have to. So if we have a couple, the grandparents are here, so maybe just one rose, so we have enough for, uh, for all of us, if we can. For one, one for couple, so if you're a, your grandparent, you could just uh, have one rose to share, if that's okay. Thank you. Was our service this morning. Can we ask uh, Dr. Herbert Thomas to please come and offer a prayer of blessing and dedication to our grandparents? I'm going to request again for all grandparents to stand. Please, thank you. And then I'm going to ask everyone else, would you please stand in honor of our grandparents? Those who are here and those who are not here, let us stand in honor of our grandparents. 
Can we acknowledge who they are before God in saying amen together? Everybody? Amen. 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 We are very grateful to our Father in heaven. I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes. You may if you choose to. But I'm asking for us to have an open eyes prayer. And picture yourself, not looking at me, but looking at him, our Father in heaven, the Ancient of Days. I will have my eyes open, and I'll try to avoid looking at those lights, and I'll be talking to our Father in heaven together with us. Our oh, Father, what a wonderful God you are. Not just Father, but your grandparent, and your great grandparent, and your great, great, great grandparent, you are the ancient of days. And so, Father, we want to say what a wonderful God you are. You've been taking care of your children for thousands of years. Father, thank you for today reminding us of one of your wonderful children. Enoch, when he had his first child, Methuselah had a special relationship from that time onwards. He walked with you. He walked well, so well with you, Father, for 300 years. You took him straight into heaven. And today, I wonder, as Dr. Rhoda, Pedro Jose Rhoda spoke to us. I wonder, Father, when did he start walking with you? When did he put aside all the things that were between himself and you? And he began to walk with you. That today he stood in this pulpit and he spoke to us. And we can see, Father, that there's a man who has taken wonderful care of himself. And that he must have been there for his wife in a very special way. They both are in their 80s, still strong, still fit. Very intelligent people, read well, love each other. How much they bless each other's lives. They must have been married for 70 years. Because they're so knitted together. And so Father, I want to say thank you for Dr. Rhoda and his wonderful wife who run regularly. Not running away from each other, but running together. We want to say thank you, Father, for his message today that reminded us of who you are. That when you are in someone's life, that life is so blessed. That life becomes unique. Taking a unique road in this world, not like others, but because you live in their hearts. You made them special. And Father, in the lifestyle they've lived, you have given them wonderful health. They must have challenges too, but you give them special health. And I know, dear Father, there are lots of grandparents here who live healthy, and there are some who live with struggles in their lives. And so we pray, dear Father, today as we talk to you as our God and as our Father, we want to say, Father, we want our seniors in this church, our grandparents in this church, to live healthy, to eat healthy to have an exercise program, to forgive, to love, to love with passion, like the passion of Dr. Rhoda, to have a passion for things that are principles, as Dr. Rhoda has demonstrated to us in this church. Father, we're asking that our parents, our grandparents will have something to live for, to live for you, our Father. To live for the gospel of Jesus Christ. To live for their children and their grandchildren. To set a great example as is Enoch. Father, we're asking that our seniors in this church will take the best care of themselves. And when they take care of themselves, Father, I know they'll live healthier, stronger, clearer minds. High intelligence, great examples to their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So, Father, we ask for your blessing upon our seniors, especially the grandparents, 
that they be loving, caring people, fashioned after the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we bless your name as our God forever and ever. Bless your name, O God.